Yes. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is Kelly from Wisonic Medical, and I'm the international sales manager from Wisonic. And first, welcome to join our global webinar of Wisonic Dandelion College. And this is a platform for sharing and learning more about our latest research and expertise of regional anesthesia, pain management, and intensive care. So today is such an honor to invite Dr. Yabus Gulkan to be our speaker and Dr. Ismet to be our moderator. Both of them are one of the top experts in the regional anesthesia. So right now I would like to introduce a bit about Dr. Ismet. Dr. Ismet is currently professor and chairman of the Department of Anesthesiology and Intensive Care at Manisa Jello Baya University Medical Faculty in Turkey. He received his medical, uh, he received his Doctor of Medicine degree from the Edge University in 1993. Dr. Ismet did his anesthesiology residency and academic progress in Manisa Jalabaya University Medical Faculty. And in 2007 to 2012, he was Associate Professor, then the Professor in the Anesthesiology Department. He's right now the currently Director of Orthopedic Anesthesia of the same department. His professional interests include acute post-operative pain, trauma, and regional anesthesia, and alexia. He is president of Association of Turkish Regional Anesthesia. So outside of work, he enjoys football. He has two children. So right now, let's welcome Dr. Ismet to introduce Dr. Yabuz Gulhan. Thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you for your introduction, Kelly. Uh, especially, I'd like to thank uh, Visonic for uh, mediating this great uh, meeting. It is a great pleasure uh, to see you all during this pandemic, uh, even if we are a digital platform. Uh, Visonic Autosounds have stood by our side as solution partners in these difficult days. Uh, regional anesthesia uh, is not contraindicated in patients with COVID-19. Regional anesthesia might owe it uh, the need for <clears throat> general anesthesia and every management. Uh, with associated aerosolization of AV secretions and uh, viral spread. For more than a uh, century, upper extremity nerve blocks have been uh, in, an indispens indispensable tool in the regional anesthesiologist uh, <clears throat> armamentarium. By providing uh, surgical anesthesia and postoperative anesthesia to the entire upper limb, uh, it has been intimately likely uh, linked to advance in orthopedic and ambulatory uh, anesthesia. Furthermore, uh, with the advent of ultrasound, uh, for example, Vasonic, upper extremity blocks are being uh, <coughs> rediscovered under a new light. Uh, to further uh, discuss uh, this topic, uh, I will invite Dr. Yavuz Gürkan uh, from Koch University in Istanbul, Turkey. He is a worldwide known and very experienced regional anesthesiologist. Uh, he, has, he was also the former president of the, the Turkish Regional Anesthesia uh, Associ Association. He is currently uh, a member of ESA uh, board. Uh, I believe uh, it will be very beneficial to listen to him. Uh, please, Dr. Yavuz Gürkan. Uh, hello, everybody. It's a great pleasure to meet all our colleagues from all over the world uh, via this webinar. It's a great opportunity to meet uh, together and to share our experience and knowledge in the field of regional anesthesia. And first of all, of course, I would like to thank Vaisonik and Kelly, Turkish Turkey's representative taking care of Turkey and uh, from the ultrasound company wise. And now I would like to start my uh, lecture with you. We will be talking about upper extremity blocks. Now, upper extremity, this is probably the strongest side of anesthesiologist uh, when it comes to regional anesthesia. The, the, maybe the most important thing is that 
here we can allow surgery to be done. This is very important. So this time when we are doing upper extremity blocks, we do surgical anesthesia. It is not just only for analgesia. There are times that we sometimes combine general anesthesia and our blocks also for upper extremity. But uh, the strong side is that uh, we are, we can most of the time do provide surgical anesthesia. So with the blocks that you perform, uh, you can uh, do uh, surgical anesthesia. Now, okay. Uh, here, I would like to review the anatomy once again. This is important for our understanding. The blocks here in the upper extremity are named according to anatomical location that they are uh, performed. So to start with, interscaline block is performed between scalene muscles here at the roof of the brachial plexus. Supraclavicular block is performed just above the clavicle and it is at the trunks or divisions level of the brachial plexus. An infraclavicular block is performed just below the clavicle. And when it comes to the axillary region, we block the terminal nerves and it is called axillary block. Sorry. Okay. So this is the interscaline area to start with. Interscaline area. Uh, sorry, it's a little bit going too fast. Okay, just a second. Okay, interscaline block we perform for uh, shoulder surgery, arm surgery, or elbow surgery. But the most important or most famous interscaline block is known for shoulder surgery. You can perform it for arm or elbow too, and even hand surgery, but for hand surgery, it's not a good choice because the inferior trunk uh, will be, or may be spared, and ulnar nerve will be spared. That's the classical knowledge, but interscaline block is best for shoulder surgery. And following shoulder surgery, functional rehabilitation and recovery is very important. And that's why we have to place uh, sometimes also catheters. Okay, when, when we have a look at the history, actual interscaline block is very old. If you look at the literature and the books, it is said Etienne first uh, performed interscaline block. But what is more classical knowledge? What is best known uh, for anesthesiologists is that uh, this technique has been introduced by Alon Vini in the way we know it today. So, Interscaline block dates from 1970. There have been different approaches that have been described in the past, but I will not go into detail because it's the ultrasound which has changed uh, interscaline block and the block performance technique dramatically. Uh, sorry, things are moving a little bit too fast, sometimes going out of my control. but we will manage it for sure. So it was Alon Vini uh, who, who performed interscaline block first. And this is how he described, this is the brachial plexus. It is done at the level of the uh, roots. And then this is the sensor innervation which covers the shoulder. If you go distal, some of the parts, the inferior trunk will not be covered. Now it's very important that we have uh, a clear understanding of the anatomy because this is the key for both understanding and for success. Now, when we look at the interscaline area, sorry, when we look at the interscaline area, here you can see the 
anterior and middle scalene muscles. And then in between two muscles, we have, uh, sorry, the pictures are moving too much, too, too fast. And in between the anterior and middle scalene muscle, you can see the C5, C6, they combine together and then C7, then C8 and T1. Here in the picture, you cannot see T1, uh, but you can see on in front of the anterior scalene muscle, the phrenic nerve, and then you can see uh, suprascapular nerve, which leads, which leaves the upper trunk. And then you can see that in the anatomy, the subclavian artery is in very close proximity. And below the clavicle, we have the pleura. On the medial side, we have vertebral artery. And uh, further, we have the central neuroaxial structures. So this picture is actually very important for a uh, whole understanding of the interscaline block, both clinical effect, physiology, and also potential complications. So seeing the phrenic nerve, a small tiny nerve lying on the anterior scalene muscle, it is easy to understand that it is technically potential to block the phrenic nerve, especially depending on the volume. If you're using high local anesthetic volumes, then the phrenic nerve may be blocked. And then because it is anatomically close to pleura, if you direct your needle inferior and medially, pneumothorax is technically still possible. If you direct your needle towards the vertebral artery, then you can do intravascular injection and then local anesthetic toxicity will be seen. And if you direct your needle to medial, close to the central neuroaxial structures, then it is technically possible that you may end up with uh, spinal or epidural anesthesia or other complications. Now, here I will show the, uh, this picture is again important for our understanding of the anatomy. Here you can see on the left side, you can see the drawing that comes from Alonvini. Uh, from 1970, middle scalene muscle and the uh, anterior scalene muscle. Here you can see in between the roots uh, and the nerve structures. This is actually almost similar to what we see in clinical practice when we are doing uh, the ultrasound guided blocks. So this is how it is seen actually today also. And on the right side, if you look, we have a cross-sectional anatomy. On the right upper part, we have uh, trachea, uh, and then the thyroid gland, and then carotid artery, jugular vein, anterior scalene and middle scalene muscles, and in between, we have the brachial plexus. So once again, it is important to notice the anatomical, uh, the proximity of brachial plexus to clinically anat important anatomical structures. And on the right side, you can also see the central neuroaxial structures. And that's why it's easy to understand that it may end up with some important complications. Now, this is just to show how it used to happen 20 years ago or 10 years ago, or uh, it may happen still in some parts of the world that we used to use huge volumes of flow anesthetic. So this is from Alain Bourguet. The dates, uh, the paper dates 2003 only, so it is less than 20 years. The dose that was given for interscaline block uh, was 30 to 50 milliliter of local anesthetic. So today it is definitely a huge amount of local anesthetic that we would never do. Plus the interscaline block general anesthesia was performed in this study. Success rate is of course 97%. As long as you are in the correct tissue plane, such high success should be expected. So it has changed a lot from the uh, past uh, towards the recent uh, clinical performances. Now, this is another important study uh, that comes from ERMI. Uh, this is also historically important. It is from 1999, 
1991. Actually, it was Ermi who first used ultrasound uh, to study interscaline block. Interestingly, or today it's interesting, actually he performed the interscaline block as conventional approach, and then he used ultrasound to assess diaphragmatic motion. In, in this case, Ermi used 34 to 52 milliliter of local anesthetic. So once again, this is a huge volume when we compare it with today's practice. And then in return of such a huge volume, the instance of diaphragmatic paresis, which means phrenic involvement was 100%. So this is what Ermi says, diaphragmatic paresis appears 100% following uh, interscaline brachial plexus flow. Now this is uh, actually, it comes from uh, social uh, media, Shibata from Japan, a well-known regional anesthesiologist and pain doctor. He had a trauma uh, following a bicycle accident and then uh, fractured the clavicle. And on the left side, you see Dr. Ahmed, his uh, uh, junior fellow, uh, his trainee that's studying regional anesthesia and learning from Shibata. And then Shibata has become uh, his student's patient. And as Dr. Ahmed performed interscaline block, Shibata said, states that, I realized phrenic nerve paralysis immediately occurring during injection and felt the gravity of my arm. So following uh, Dr. Ahmed's injection, the interscaline block performance, Shibata could feel it immediately, the phrenic nerve paralysis. So this is such an issue. Some important papers came later on following uh, the interscaline, following the introduction of ultrasound into clinical practice. And one of the important papers about interscaline block came from Riazi. Riazi in 2008 has shown, has compared 20 versus five milliliter, uh, five milliliter of local anesthetic for uh, interscaline block. And he found that five milliliter was almost had the same equal quality of anesthesia versus 20 milliliter. So Riazi has shown that actually interscaline block can be performed using only five milliliter of local anesthetic. But what is more interesting, if you use low dose of local anesthetic, like, like five milliliter, then the incidence of diaphragmatic paresis is much lower. When you use, when he used actually 20 milliliter of local anesthetic, the phrenic nerve paresis incidence was 100%. And in the group that he used only five milliliter, the incidence of diaphragmatic paralysis was 45%. So it is less than half. So this was a major and clinically important improvement. And if you look at some other so-called minor side effects, the patients in the 20 milliliter group had more uh, side effects, or you may call them physiological effects. So Horner syndrome was noticed, hoarseness, respiratory di distress, severe respiratory distress in one patient, and one patient had hic hiccup. So if you use less volume than the so-called relatively minor side effects, incidence is also decreased. Now, this paper has come from uh, Philippe Gautier, Admir Hadzic, group, and they studied the minimum effective anesthetic volume of 0.75% ropivacaine in ultrasound guided interscaline block. Uh, and what was their finding? This is a recent study compared to Riazi's paper. And Gautier and Hadzic, they found that five milliliter of 0.75% of ropivacaine was enough for successful surgical anesthesia. So I want you to realize that there is a big, big, big improvement from what we, what uh, or how we used to perform 
intercalin block uh, in 20 years ago has changed dramatically. So low planetary volumes has decreased from 30 to 50 milliliter and inevitable uh, diaphragmatic paresis to only 5%, to only uh, 5 milliliter of local anesthetic and the instance of diaphragmatic paresis decreases. Now, when we talk about interscaline block, if you remember the first uh, anatomical picture, the cadaver picture, and you remember the relevant anatomical structure, structures, it is easy to understand that interscaline block may cause some important uh, side effects or complications too. Now, anatomically interscaline, brachial plexus at interscaline area is close to the sympathetic ganglia. If you look at the picture on the right side, you can see the ganglia. So Horner syndrome may be seen, sympathetic block uh, occur. Recurrent laryngeal nerve and hoarseness may occur in some parts of the, in some patients. And it is important that you are aware that Horner syndrome and hoarseness is a common finding or a potential uh, conclusion. Then you can uh, reassure your patients that these Horner syndrome and the other side effects are known effects, and then they will disappear as the block also wears off. So these are uh, common side effects, but they are not all. We know that phrenic nerve, we all already talked about phrenic nerve paresis. This is clinically important, maybe probably the most important side in clinical practice. Besides, you may have bradycardia and hypotension from uh, basal cherish reflex. As we told, vascular puncture and local anesthetic systemic toxicity is technically possible because of anatomical proximity of the uh, brachial plexus to vascular structures, and then in conclusion, local anesthetic systemic toxicity. Unfortunately, even more serious neurological injuries may occur. Unfortunately, following interscaline block, total spinal anesthesia, spinal cord injury have been reported. Epidural anesthesia, especially if you're using a huge volume, would be a potential physiological effect and unfortunately, brachial plexus at the interscaline area is most. Area is probably uh, the most vulnerable site for neurological injury uh, following interscaline uh, block. Uh, I'm sorry that the slides are moving a little bit out of my control but uh, surely we will come to the point. Okay, so technically intraneural injections are unfortunately uh, serious uh, potential complications. Okay, here some case reports about uh, the uh, use of following interscaline block. Spinal anesthesia, epidural anesthesia, and unfortunately, intrathecal injections that resulted in uh, some complications. Okay, the anesthesiologists have been looking for solutions to prevent a special diaphragmatic paresis, yet provide uh, adequate and complete analgesia for shoulder surgery. And it was found that combined suprascapular and axillary nerve block could provide quite effective analgesia uh, following shoulder surgery. And it was first uh, published by Price DJ in 2006. He has shown in his paper that suprascapular nerve and axillary nerve are quite important in the innervation of shoulder, sur shoulder joint. And we already know, or it's kind of classical knowledge, it's of course open to discussion, that the suprascapular nerve is responsible for 70% of the innervation of shoulder. Of course, it needs to be verified. Maybe this is an old belief, but we all know both from regional anesthesia side and also uh, from the anesthesia, from the pain side, we know that uh, suprascapular nerve 
is definitely very important nerve. And Price DJ in his paper has shown both the nerve stimulation approach to suprascapular and axillary nerve. And axillary nerve is blocked uh, when it turns around the humerus. So on the bottom of the page, you can see the ultrasound images of suprascapular and axillary nerves. Now it is important now that today we have so many different techniques of uh, performing blocks uh, for different kinds of surgery. It is important that we should compare which technique is superior to the other. I mean, is suprascapular nerve and axillary nerve block is as effective as interscaline bl plexus block and also is the so-called shoulder surgery as safe as we really think that it is. Now in this study, important study, suprascapular and axillary nerve block, so-called shoulder uh, block, has been compared to interscaline block. And for shoulder surgery, uh, for shoulder block, uh, 10 milliliter of ropivacaine was administered for each selective nerve. And for the interscaline block, uh, 20 milliliter of local anesthetic was administered. So 20 milliliter can be still considered high uh, if you uh, compare it to the findings that five milliliter is really accurate. Now, when you look at the interscaline block, they had 50 patients and the instance of dyspnea, clinical dyspnea in the interscaline block was 18%. On the other hand, if you do selective nerve blocks for shoulder surgery, then the instance of diaphragmatic paresis is only uh, zero. So there is no diaphragmatic paresis if you perform uh, suprascapular, uh, if you perform suprascapular and uh, axillary nerve block. Now, this is a relatively new area uh, which needs uh, that lots of studies should be done. So this is one of the important ones. And then here, here came uh, more distal and more selective blocks. So there has been a change from times of uh, DJ Price uh, to today's new information that comes from new anatomical studies. This is a paper from Emilio Gonzalez uh, Arne. He studied anterior approach for axillary nerve block, uh, which is an interesting paper I strongly recommend you to read and study. Now, in his case, uh, Emilio has administered the local anesthetic in between deltoid muscle and subscapularis muscle. So this is kind of an interfacial block. So he did not directly go into the nerve itself, but instead, but instead injected local anesthetic in in between two muscle uh, tissue planes and doing a more so-called little bit more proximal axillary nerve, nerve block, uh, he could uh, somehow do a more complete axillary nerve block. So he could actually block more branches of the axillary nerve as in a way more complete uh, selective block. And then this is how he performed uh, the block using ultrasound guidance. He just uh, injected the local anesthetic. On the right side, you can see the deltoid muscle and the subscapularis muscle. So in between two muscles, tissue plane, he injected the local anesthetic. He used a linear probe because it's rather superficial. The arm was abducted, and then you can inject five or 10 milliliter of local anesthetic it should be sufficient for complete uh, block of the axillary nerve. But this is not all. After axillary nerve and not concomitantly, at the same time, there, was, uh, there came another study uh, about more anterior approach to, sub, uh, to uh, suprascapular nerve. There are several nerves about the anterior approach of the suprascapular nerves. I'm sorry for the fast moving of uh, the slides. It's somehow going a little bit out of my control. But here is the study. This one is from Shambi, uh, 2019. Just below the omohyoid muscle. If you look at the right side, you can see the omohyoid muscle. It is easier. Then you can selectively block suprascapular nerve. 
So if you think of the anatomy, and if you remember uh, the first picture, the first anatomical image that I shared with you uh, from the cadaver, you can see that the suprascapular nerve goes from anterior then to the posterior. And just like any other nerve, if you do the nerve block more proximal, then it is for sure that you will include, you will include uh, more branches, small branches of the nerve. Now, this is the anatomical study that came from uh, Shambi. He studied following five milliliter of local anesthetic injection. He studied the local, the dye spread. And then he has shown that the superior trunk was blocked in 90%, or actually the dye spread to the superior trunk in 90%, suprascapular nerve, of course, 90% stain, middle trunk, 80%, and inferior trunk was uh, dyed with uh, 20%. And a surprise phrenic nerve, even with anterior selective suprascapular nerve block with five milliliter, the phrenic nerve, uh, 20 milliliter, tw sorry, 20% of the cases, uh, phrenic nerve was mildly stained. We, we don't know the clinical effect, not yet. But here came, of course, an important study. This is very important study, and this is very recent. Here, it was uh, the anterior suprascapular nerve block, supraclavicular nerve block, and interscalene nerve block were compared. This is very important. It is good enough that we are performing uh, clinically effective blocks, but the safety is very important and how it changes the clinical practice. If you look at, if you block the interscalene block, the vital capacity will be 67% of the preoperative baseline. So in a way, the vital capacity will decrease 33%. If you do a supraclavicular block, vital capacity will be 76% of the preoperative baseline, and it will be 90% if you perform anterior suprascapular nerve. So anterior suprascapular nerve is definitely superior to the interscalene and suprascapular nerves considering the phrenic nerve involvement. Now here, an important comment has come from uh, Dr. Josh Arjan uh, from American Hospital in Istanbul. He, just like the previous study, uh, said that anterior suprascapular block may not avoid diaphragmatic paresis. So there are actually quite many small tricks and uh, small uh, improvements that need to be done clinically to provide the safety of our patients, uh, to provide the safety of uh, our uh, patients. Now, this is hemidiaphragmatic paralysis, another paper following ultrasound guided anterior versus posterior suprascapular nerve block. This is also very important. It is very recent, but what is interesting? Now, Otis, uh, Ferre and Minville, uh, a well-known group from uh, Toulouse, France, they administered 10 milliliter of local anesthetic. Here, the volume is much higher than the previous study, which was only five milliliter. So when they administer 10 milliliter of local anesthetic, in addition with dexamethasone, they had an interesting finding. The anterior, with the anterior approach, hemidiaphragmatic paresis incidence was uh, 41%. So this is kind of huge, uh, big incidence, actually. 40% of the patients with anterior suprascapular nerve block had diaphragmatic involvement. But I have to remind you that here, the volume that was administered was uh, 10 milliliter, uh, which is uh, quite high compared to the previous study. But what is even more interesting, even if you perform a posterior, which is far away from the phrenic nerve and the anterior scalene muscle, even if you administer a posterior approach, then the incidence of diaphragmatic paresis was 2%. That means it is not only anesthesia or nerve block related uh, complications. Sometimes just like in many other parts of the body uh, and nerve blocks, uh, diaphragmatic paresis, 
and phrenic nerve involvement may be sometimes uh, unrelated to anesthesia and maybe to surgical traction or other reasons. Now, when we are talking about especially sur shoulder surgery, uh, it is an old tradition many colleagues would like to perform supraclavicular nerve block too. Now, this time we are talking about cervical plexus. So we, we changed from brachial plexus to cervical plexus. If you look at the anatomy on the left side, you can see that behind the sternocleidomastoid muscle, there are four uh, terminal nerves, which are important in the innervation of neck. But if you think of shoulder surgery, uh, supraclavicular nerve, which has many branches and innervates the clavicle, is important both for shoulder and also for clavicle surgery. And then we have the transverse cervical, greater auricular nerve, and lesser occipital nerve here. And here is the uh, sensory innervation provided by cervical uh, plexus block. On the left side, if you look at the image, uh, it's uh, cervical plexus block is responsible for the innervation or anesthesia or analgesia of a great extent of the uh, neck and to some extent shoulder and clavicle surgery. My clinical practice is sometimes to add a small dose, relatively small dose to cervical plexus if I'm interested in doing a more complete block, especially if it is a clavicle surgery and I would like to perform a small dose cervical plexus block too. And knowing the fact that I will be blocking greater auricular nerve, lesser occipital nerve, transverse cervical and supraclavicular nerve. The anatomy, I will not uh, go much into the details, but simply briefly, I want to uh, tell you that if you administer five or 10 milliliters of local anesthetic, Cervical plexus block is just behind the sternocleidomastoid muscle. And then there you will see small hypoechoic round structures, which represent the cervical plexus. We like to use an out of plane approach just to decrease the tissue trauma and make it less painful for the patient. We are using a five centimeter needle and the anatomical structures are very superficial, only one to two centimeters. So the next block I would like to talk about is a supraclavicular block. Supraclavicular block is also once again, 100 years old block almost. Uh, Klemp come from Germany introduced the technique and they published a quite large case series. And later on, Vini approach, Vini and Collins approach has become important. And there are many other approaches that have been described, but the next step, which is clinically important, is the ultrasound technique. Now, what is interesting with supraclavicular block? This is once again a historical paper coming from 1961, but which is very important. Here in this paper, Pepper and Brent has uh, published their clinical experience with supraclavicular block, but the interesting thing is that their success rate was 84%, but more important, the incidence of pneumothorax was 6%. So this is unacceptable at any time. And unfortunately for this reason, because of safety reasons, not many people really performed supraclavicular block. So it was probably in the hands of very few uh, talented people that were doing or performing supraclavicular block almost every day. But otherwise, it was not a, a commonly performed block until recently. Now, ultrasound has changed the fate of supraclavicular block, actually. Now, this paper is from uh, Carlo Franco. Uh, Carlo Franco has published, uh, has performed supraclavicular block. He was more a a supraclavicular block person. And this is just to give some insight to our younger colleagues about how regional anesthesia changed in time and how ultrasound has contributed to this change. Carlo Franco was administering 40%, 40, sorry, 40 milliliter of local anesthetic and success rate was very high at that time, 97% and even 
very high and acceptable for today. He was using a nerve stimulation guided technique. But Carlo Franco was once again one of the few uh, people with extensive experience with supraclavicular blow. And then came the ultrasound technique, which, which has changed, which has almost changed the fate of uh, supraclavicular blow. This time it was the uh, Doppler clinical effect, which was uh, the first paper actually, because brachial plexus is so close to the subclavian artery and subclavian artery is a big major artery, which and uh, brachial plexus is superior and lateral to the subclavian artery. Then Doppler was used to detect the subclavian, the location of subclavian artery, and then the block was performed. But later on, the ultrasound technique has developed. This is how we perform ultrasound technique today. We are using a linear probe, and uh, you can see the plexus. It's like uh, a bunch of grapes, small and round, uh, surrounding the subclavian artery. On the medial side, we have the pleura and the lung tissue. And on the right side, we have the costa. Now, supraclavicular is now a common practice for uh, many anesthesiologists. Vincent Chen is one of the important and big names for us, especially when, when it comes to supraclavicular block. In the beginning, he has published quite a lot about supraclavicular block. This is his approach, so-called corner pocket. If you look at the big arrow, he was injecting just in between the uh, subclavian artery and close to the, to the corner. And, uh, at that time, they were saying that uh, low dose, like 15 milliliter, would be enough for uh, successful uh, supraclavicular blow. But time has shown that it was probably uh, probably patients needed slightly more uh, local anesthetics. So this second paper again has come uh, from Vincent Chan's group. Uh, and this time they, sorry for the uh, slides. Okay. Here this time, uh, Vincent Chen in time, he started uh, with 40 milliliter, has changed to 50 milliliter, decreased the dose. It was a trend at those days to decrease the local anesthetic doses more and more. But time has shown us that actually the effective, uh, minimum effective volume of lidocaine for successful uh, ED90 is uh, 30 milliliter. And another paper has shown uh, 33 milliliters. So it is around, you should at least administer uh, 30 milliliter of local anesthetic uh, for uh, success in 90% of our patients. Now, here another paper, this time Hiroaki Murata from Japan. He has shown that there are two important arteries here at the site of the supraclavicular area. These are transverse cervical and dorsal scapular arteries. And when you are performing supraclavicular block, it is wise uh, to tilt the probe, look at different angles, and try to see these two arteries, and it will help you to find the best needle track to avoid vascular puncture. Complications when it comes to uh, supraclavicular block, block specific complications are vascular puncture and pneumothorax, and unfortunately also phrenic nerve involvement may, seem, may be seen from 6% in the history, uh, from 6% uh, instance of uh, Pneumothorax in the history, now it is one in 2,000 patients uh, from Bahati. Now, this is an important paper, once again, for our understanding. This is a quantitative analysis of respiratory, motor, and sensory function for supraclavicular block. It dates from 1998. They administer 30 milliliter of local anesthetic. The instance of hemidiaphragmatic paresis was uh, 50%. When supraclavicular and infraclavicular blocks were compared by Kostyuk Nielsen, uh, the finding that the uh, small, the so-called minor side effects were more common with supra compared to infra, 
and the instance of diaphragm diaphragmatic paresis was again higher in supra and zero in infraclavicular probe. Now, this is another uh, study comparing infraclavicular block versus uh, supraclavicular block from uh, trans group. Their finding was that supraclavicular block was uh, had a quicker onset time compared to infraclavicular. As you know, supra is known, it's an old naming, but it is known as spinal anesthesia of the, bra uh, of the brachial cord, so it is rather fast. When it comes to infraclavicular block, uh, this is we this time we perform the uh, block just below the clavicle at the level of the cords, and there are three cords, as you know, that surround the uh, uh, surround the axillary or subclavian artery. We have lateral, posterior, and medial cords, and when we look at the history, it is rather old once again. It was first described by Bazi in uh, Paris, but the most important, once again here, it was Raj approach in 1973. There have been many other approaches that have been described. Coracoid blocks are important. And uh, lateral sagittal approach is important. That's the technique we are using today uh, that came from Oyvind Kostad in 2004. And relatively new approach is costa clavicular block from Karmakar. This is the uh, Raj approach, actually. Uh, Raj has shown that uh, he performed the block just below the clavicle. The arm was abducted. For the first time, he used uh, nerve stimulation. So this is also an improvement, a new step uh, for regional anesthesia at that time. And then Raj has shown that success rate was 95%. This is important, the local anesthetic spread for us. And Raj has clearly described the technique, uh, infraclavicular block. He said that infraclavicular block provides excellent anesthesia of the whole arm up to the shoulder. So infraclavicular block uh, is good uh, for hand surgery, elbow surgery, distal arm surgery, but for shoulder surgery, it's not that accurate. And if you look at the local anesthetic spread, the cluster is mainly below the clavicle. Another important approach in the history of infraclavicular is from Oivind Klostad. He suggested that you can inject the local anesthetic between coracoid presses and clavicle. That's the injection side. And here is the needle. At those years, we were performing as it uh, using nerve stimulation guidance. And Owen Klastat is the father of this approach, which is widespread used all over the world. Now, this is important. What does infraclavicular block do? This is from Zbigniew kosciak nielsen kosciak nielsen has clearly shown that infraclavicular block will uh, block the whole arm up to the shoulder. Axillary nerve is uh, blocked in 67% of the patients. Knowing that axillary nerve is to some extent uh, important for shoulder surgery, now there is a new trend to use infraclavicular block also for shoulder surgery in combination with suprascapular nerve block. So time is changing, life is changing, and every day some new information comes regarding the blocks and the techniques. Now, this is important study from Axel Sauter. He clearly showed the uh, distribution of uh, three cords that surround the artery. Lateral cord is most superficial, posterior cord is posterior to the artery, and medial cord. All these uh, three cords can be at different locations uh, regarding the artery, but more important, if you inject your local anesthetic in a clockwise around eight o'clock, then it will cover most of the uh, cords and it will end up with successful anesthesia. For the infraclavicular block, we use in my clinical practice mainly linear probes, in plane approach, and for adult patients, eight centimeter needle. 
This is the ultrasound image. You can see the pectoralis muscles, major and minor, and then axillary artery. Cords are seen as hyperechoic structures. Axillary vein is caudal. And this is the uh, this is the ideal local anesthetic spread. So local anesthetic should surround the artery in a U shape so that all the cords are blocked. If you have a patient with high body mass index, then you should uh, use a convex probe or micro convex probe, a, a probe that shows deeper structures. And you can see here the artery is uh, hypoechoic ground, and you can see the nerves if you follow the arrow as hyperechoic structures surrounding the artery. Now, what is the minimum effective volume for uh, infraclavicular block? If you use ropivacaine 7.5 milligram per milliliter, it was found to be 31 milliliter. In my clinical practice, I've been using 30 milliliter of local anesthetic routinely for adult patients. But if you think from time to time you, that you have done a perfect block, you can even use lower doses. That's also technically possible. Okay. So unfortunately, I cannot uh, move my uh, slides. May I, may I have the next slide? Can, uh... Okay, my screen has uh, freezing, has frozen. Unfortunately. Okay. Okay, I will restart my uh, PowerPoint. I hope that yeah, it comes okay uh, in a minute. And then we have talked already about the infraclavicular block. So we have covered actually the proximal side of the uh, brachial plexus, supraclavicular block, and now it is uh, time uh, uh, to go uh, more distal. Now, catheter blocks. I hope that you, you can all see uh, infraclavicular area is actually the best site for uh, catheters because pectoralis muscles keep the catheter in place. And if you have such a patient that needs physiotherapy, uh, for a long time, then uh, you should definitely place a catheter for the infraclavicular uh, site. Complications, vascular puncture and pneumothorax are two potential complications specific for uh, infraclavicular block. But using lateral sagittal approach, actually, you should not see the pleura and you should be away from pleura and the technique should be safe, actually. There is a new approach described by... Uh, Manoj Karmakar, uh, costa clavicular block. Now this time, uh, costa clavicle. And then here you see the anatomical uh, dissection, the artery and surrounding uh, cords. And this histological picture is showing clearly the artery and uh, three cords. This is how it is uh, performed. The patient arm is abducted, and this is the setting uh, for ergonomic uh, block. This is how the block is performed. Uh, Manoj is using a linear probe and then an in-plane approach. Now, what is special for this costoclavicular approach actually? It is important that the costoclavicular block is safe regarding the hemidiaphragmatic paresis if you compare it to supraclavicular block. 
So one patient in the costal clavicular uh, group had hemidiaphragmatic paresis, and nine patients in the supraclavicular uh, block. And this is an important study. Now that we have different approaches to infraclavicular block, which is the best, uh, this study compared costal clavicular with lateral sagittal approach, and the finding was that uh, costal clavicular block is a little faster. Axilla, this is an important area for us, not for only brachial plexus and upper extremity, but for thoracic analgesia, for uh, breast analgesia, and so on. But today our topic is only axillary block, the brachial upper extremity blocks. Axillary block is still the most commonly performed block in the whole world because it's technically simple. It is superficial. We block terminal nerves one by one and they are surrounded, uh, they surround the artery in different positions. As you see, the anatomical variations are common. One important, clinically important knowledge is that musculocutaneous is leaving the plexus a little bit early. Now, this anatomical picture shows the axillary area and the nerves in this field. And it is, once again, all teaching that if you administer around 40 milliliters of local anesthetic, it will cover the whole neurovascular sheet and it will end up with complete uh, axillary block. What is important clinically is that musculocutaneous nerve is separate most of the time from the rest of the nerves, median, ulnar, and radial, and you should definitely selectively block musculocutaneous nerve separately other than the uh, three other nerves. Now, there are basically two techniques for axillary block, one is perineural, which means you inject local anesthetic around the nerves. Your target is this time nerves. And the other approach is perivascular, which means your target is the axillary artery. And if you surround the axillary artery with enough volume, it will end up with a successful block. But still, you should selectively block the musculocutaneous nerve. An important paper has shown that only one milliliter of local anesthetic nerve, uh, local anesthetic is enough for selective uh, nerve blocks in the axillary block. But this information uh, holds true also in other parts uh, of the body. Only one milliliter can, one milliliter of local anesthetic can selectively uh, block a single nerve in the body. So what should be the ideal or adequate local anesthetic volume for axillary block. Now, this is once again an old paper from 1999 from uh, Kostiak Nielsen, who is one of my great mentors. He studied low-dose selective or targeted injections of the terminal nerves during uh, axillary block. He injected five milliliters of local anesthetics for each nerve, in total 20 milliliter. And the other group was a transarterial technique, which is uh, not really commonly used. So you may consider it as a perivascular technique. And the incidence of block success was 87% in the axillary block and in the transarterial technique, 54%. So if you do a very selective block, you can use much lower doses but still be very successful. These are other papers uh, showing that 20 to 30 milliliter of local anesthetic should be enough uh, for axillary nerve block. Now, there are still more to talk about. There are distal nerve blocks. There are two reasons why, do, why we do distal nerve blocks. Either to supplement an incomplete block, think of you have done a supraclavicular block or infraclavicular block, and if there is only one single nerve that is missing, you should not consider this block as failure because you can selectively block the missing nerve in the arm or forearm. Second indication is to provide anesthesia or analgesia for very small distal and minor surgery. Musculocutaneous nerve, as we said, leaves the axilla early it goes uh, around the coracobrachialis muscle and it has a typical image on the ultrasound guidance this is the sensor area uh, that musculocutaneous nerve is responsible 
You can block it at the axillary area or mid-humeral level. Here, this is the musculocutaneous nerve. So you can see that it is far away from artery. It's not just next to it. And the median, ulnar, and radial nerves, on the other hand, surround the artery. One clinically important reminder is that axillary artery and nerves are also joined with the veins. So when you are doing axillary block, you should uh, definitely uh, search the anatomy, scan the anatomy also for axillary vein, not only artery, nerves, or and also the muscular tennis nerve. Because if you apply pressure in the axillary area, because all these vascular structures and special veins are superficial, they will be compressed and you may miss them and inadvertently do an intravascular injection. Radial nerve uh, can be blocked at several sites. It's one of the major important big nerves for the forearm. It is, in a, it is responsible for the motor and sensory innervation and mainly the extensors. This is where I like to do the block actually at the antecubital uh, fossa. Here you can see the radial nerve. On the medial side, we have the antebrachial artery and the median nerve and radial nerve is uh, on the other side. <clears throat> now this is uh, blocking the radial nerve around, around the humerus. Here you can see the radial nerve and brachial artery. It's a small nerve here this time uh, at the mid humeral level, but you can trace the nerve, follow the nerve and do the block just as you like. Now, for me in my clinical practice, I like to do the block uh, at the antecubital fossa. Here, how it looks, the radial nerve, it is, it is something like with two eyes. It has typical image. It is easy to locate and uh, it is easy to do a successful block using only low doses. When it comes to median nerve, median nerve is uh, very easy to locate, starting from uh, either antecubital fossa or from axilla. Uh, or uh, at distal sites in the distal uh, forearm, it's in the middle of the arm. But in my clinical practice, I like to do the block uh, or start scanning from just medial to the antebrachial artery because uh, then it is uh, technically very easy. Uh, brachial artery is big, pulsatile, and easy uh, to locate using ultrasound guidance. And then uh, you can do the block just anywhere. So here is radial nerve at the antecubital fossa. Medial nerve is uh, on the medial side of the brachial artery. And we have also the ulnar, art, ulnar nerve at the olecranon fossa. Ulnar nerve and ulnar artery trace together uh, at the wrist level. This is an easy site to locate the uh, nerve. Uh, you can do the block just anywhere except olecranon fossa because it's a narrow space. And then uh, here, this is uh, after the block performance. Now, just like the brachial plexus, the major sites, uh, you can place catheters, not also to brachial plexus itself, but also close to the isolated nerves. So this is just one of the papers showing uh, selective ulnar nerve catheterization, but it's also possible for other nerves too. So you can do axillary block or you can do distal more selective blocks depending on the site of surgery. If you're talking about second finger, then radial, radial and median nerve should be, nerve blocks should be sufficient. But in clinical practice, something important is that the surgeon will ask you, uh, will uh, use a tourniquet and then uh, he will be uh, afraid of tourniquet pain. That's why in clinical practice, surgeons are most of the time are asking for major plexus blocks instead of uh, very selective and distal blocks. I would like to thank you for uh, listening to me and uh, thank you very much for joining. Uh, I'm uh, sorry with the slide, sometimes it moved out of my control and I'm uh, ready. Uh, to receive uh, questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your outstanding presentation, Yavuz. Uh, there are many. There are many questions we would like to ask you. Uh, let me share them uh, with you. First, a participant asked for 
uh, what is your choice uh, of nerve block for hand surgery? Now, for hand surgery, Dr. Ismet, uh, my choice, choice is infraclavicular block. And the reason why uh, I like to do the infraclavicular block is that it definitely completes more, provides more complete uh, anesthesia compared to the axillary nerve block. It is technically easy. It's on only single injection. And then uh, it is uh, the best site for brachial plexus catheters. And then the block uh, success rate is uh, highly reliable. Okay, let's go back to this page. It looks nicer. Okay, please continue, sorry. Ah, okay, uh, thank you. I also use, I also prefer uh, to use infraclavicular block, but for very obese patients uh, during the uh, end surgery, I can also use the axillar block. Uh, it is easier, easier to apply uh, axillar nerve block and it, has, it also has uh, the advantage of blocking only the nerves if I want, uh, for example, median nerve for uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, not uh, the entire arm as uh, in infraclavicular nerve block. And uh, we can use uh, less local anesthetic uh, in, uh, with axillary nerve block and approximately 20 milliliters uh, <clears throat> is enough uh, for surgical surgical anesthesia. Uh, I think I think uh, that old regional anesthesia should now uh, all types of brachial plexus uh, blocks uh, so they can choose uh, and find the best alternative for uh, the case. Okay, uh, question. So the other questions. Uh, <clears throat> Do you let surgery uh, be done under under scan block, or do you combine general anesthesia and nerve block? Now, this uh, uh, actually many anesthesiologists, especially young colleagues, are uh, colleagues are interested in uh, doing the surgery under with regional anesthesia and nerve blocks alone. But uh, the point is that when we are talking about shoulder surgery, unfortunately, patient position. Uh, duration of surgery, and so on. There are lots of different things. The, the face is covered, uh, and especially cold fluids are administered. It's long duration. It's not very comfortable for the patient to stand still uh, for a long time in that position. In my clinical practice, I like to uh, the surgery to be done under general anesthesia, but before I put the patients asleep, I do an ultrasound-guided interstellar block. But may I also ask you, Ismet, because I know that you're also taking care of many shoulder uh, surgeries. What's your choice? <laughs> I know that you are more <laughs> for regional anesthesia <laughs> alone. <laughs> okay. Uh, shoulder surgery is actually a challenge uh, for us regional anesthesiologists and uh, orthopedic anesthesiologists. Uh, patients are in a big chair and are covered uh, and surgeon uh, usually have uh, duped in uh, choosing uh, the, sur the surgical methods. <laughs> uh, so I add uh, the cervical plexus block to the uh, brachial plexus block uh, and uh, <clears throat> often uh, at the suprascopular nerve block. Uh, I don't need uh, to use general anesthesia only. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, similar similar questions. Do you perform uh, intercranial block under anesthesia or awake? Uh, I almost always perform uh, nerve blocks awake, and the reason is uh, awake. When the patient is awake, you have certainly one more monitor. That means uh, the patient. If you somehow do intraneural injection, uh, the patient uh, will complain of pain. And then you can be aware that you are doing something wrong. So when you perform the block in an awake patient, you have one more neurological monitor. That's why in adult patients, I definitely do 
uh, my blocks before surgery, always before surgery, and uh, awake, but under, of course, appropriate sedation. If it's very painful, you may give some uh, little fentanyl or midazolam whatsoever. Uh, but I perform the blocks awake before surgery, and then I put the patient asleep if it is necessary. Okay. Uh, do you think anterior suprascopular nerve block will replace interscular blocks? Okay, this is a challenging question. I mean, this is uh, what needs to be studied, of course, and we are also studying uh, anterior approach to suprascapular nerve block. It definitely provides some degree of analgesia. It is uh, very selective, uh, fine, refined technique, that's for sure. But the point is that if you are doing anterior suprascapular nerve block with high volumes, like 10 milliliter, if you ask me, is high. If you are doing selective uh, anterior suprascapular nerve block, then it will resemble more like interscalene block, or it will resemble like uh, low dose uh, supraclavicular block. So it is very important how you perform the anterior suprascapular nerve. Uh, but in time, of course, all we are still looking for a better block, a safer block for shoulder surgery, because as uh, we talked about, supraclavicular block has many, unfortunately, uh, physiological effects, so-called, and besides complications. That's why uh, we are in search of a better technique. Anterior suprascapular nerve block may be an alternative, and time will show. Yes, uh, shoulder block, doing you know, a shoulder block, uh, shoulder block and uh, shoulder block uh, is uh, suprascopular block and uh, axillary nerve block. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> I have a shoulder block experience uh, for surgical anesthesia. However, I think it is uh, appropriate uh, in very limited case. Uh, as I said, shoulder surgery is challenging. <laughs> Uh, Yavuz, uh, another uh, question. Do you often place catheters or do single shot blocks? Uh, it depends on surgery. If it is shoulder surgery, uh, in my clinical practice and in my institution at Koch University, uh, we are almost always uh, placing uh, interscaling catheters because postoperative rehabilitation is another important part for uh, take for the anesthesia management. It's not good enough that you give high quality anesthesia and pain relief during the uh, intraoperative and early postoperative period, but you should cover the early few days at least uh, for uh, postoperative physiotherapy. So for interscaline block, yes, I do place catheters. And for the rest, if the patient is going to need physiotherapy, uh, I like to do an infraclavicular catheter. So if it is shoulder surgery, interscaling catheter, if it is hand surgery or elbow surgery or wrist surgery, whatever, then it is an infraclavicular catheter. But for hand surgery, uh, catheters are not my routine. My routine is more uh, single shot blocks, but catheters in selected patients. But for shoulder surgery, my Routine practice is placing a catheter. Next one. Sorry, sorry. What is your primary uh, choice for catheters? Yours? Now, for brachial plexus, I like to uh, choose the lateral sagittal infraclavicular approach because mm -hmm. with the infraclavicular uh, approach, uh, catheter dislodgement is not a problem. This is very important. It is rather safe. You don't have to uh, produce uh, tunnels or whatsoever. It is technically simple, straightforward, clinically effective. Catheter dislodgement is not a problem. But for the interscaline, block shoulder surgery interscaline, but then we have problems uh, with the catheter dislodgement problems. It may be removed, unfortunately. It is Every time we fix it or try to fix it very well, but at the end of surgery itself, uh, we have a, another look. Uh, if we have to, sometimes we uh, do the bandaging once again. Uh, uh, is there a role uh, for selective and very distant nerve block in clinical practice? 
Now, it is uh, in my clinical practice for hand surgery, it is not common. Uh, the reason is that uh, in my clinical practice, I use infraclavicular block for hand surgery. And then with this approach, it is almost uh, 100% or reaching near 100% success rate. So it is about 95% success rate. That's why I don't really need uh, to supplement the hand surgery for incomplete blocks. It's not common. With ultrasound, success rate is very high. But if the patient has something, a small surgery, then it may be good to do a something small uh, selective nerve blocks, uh, but it is not uh, common. Uh, Dr. Ismet, I don't... Okay, okay, uh, okay, okay. Uh, another question uh, from Surish Chand. Uh, if you meet a child between 6 and uh, 12 years old, how much does drug are safer uh, during surgery? In pediatric patients... Uh, okay, in pediatric patients, my dose would be 0.5 milliliter per kilogram. But because it's a child, the patient will be receiving also general anesthesia. So that means a block plus general anesthesia. In this case, you don't have to give full dose uh, local anesthetic, but instead you can give 0.25% bupivacaine. So my dose would be 0.5 milliliter per kilogram, and the local anesthetic concentration would be 0.25% so you have diluted. But of course, you should calculate these doses according to ideal body weight. In these days, unfortunately, like just adults, children also may have obesity. And uh, if you don't think about the ideal body mass, you may give a huge amount of local anesthetic, which would be clinically uh, wrong. Okay. Uh, there are uh, very good questions. Uh, what the combination of uh, peripheral nerve block, which recommended as anesthesia for clavicular uh, subfractor surgery? Uh, for clavicle uh, surgery, yeah. you may combine interscaline block, low dose interscaline, plus uh, low dose cervical plexus. If you ask me, I would do five milliliter of local anesthetic for interscaline and then five milliliter of local anesthetic uh, for the cervical plexus because supraclavicular nerve comes uh, from the cervical plexus. But talking about clavicle surgery, you know, there are many different uh, other techniques. Uh, simply injecting the local anesthetic uh, around the fracture using ultrasound guidance is another approach uh, that seems to be successful. Uh, maybe we can add a uh, clavicular pectoral fascia plane block uh, for uh, clavicular uh, fracture surgery. Uh, okay. Sure. Uh, in other, in other questions uh, from Samara Jaya, uh, where is the safest uh, of the needle tip position for ultrasound guided interscular nerve block? Okay, this is important. Thank you for the question. When we are doing interscaline block, I mean, people are asking where we should inject. It is more important that you are in the correct tissue plane. Okay, this is important. You don't have to selectively look or find nerves. If you are in the tissue plane, in between anterior and middle scalene muscle, in between the fascia, it is good enough that you inject at some certain location, five milliliter or 10 milliliter of local anesthetic would be uh, sufficient. And then you don't have to really go in between the nerves or every time you redirect your needle, then you take another risk for potential neurological injuries. So for interscaline block, please do not redirect your needles all the time. It is good enough that you are in the correct tissue plane and because it's a narrow area, low dose local anesthetic volume will definitely work. Okay, Yavuz, thank you very much. We still have questions, <laughs> but I have to look out 
because we run out of time. Unfortunately, uh, I have uh, to end up session. Uh, I'd like to thank you, Ulrich, again uh, for your contributions and participations. Uh, dear Dr. Gurkan, <laughs> is there anything you would <laughs> you would like to add? <laughs> <laughs> well, it has been a good session. I am sorry that uh, my slides in the beginning was uh, running out of my control. It has been a technical problem with sharing uh, uh, slides from Istanbul to the rest of the whole world. Uh, sometimes some mishaps occur, unfortunately. Uh, but after all, we all had the opportunity to meet together and talk to each other and uh, ask questions. Uh, I would like to thank you, uh, Chairman, uh, Dr. Smith. Thank you very much uh, for your valuable contribution. It has been thank great you. to meet you once again. And I would like to thank, of course, Wysonic Company and uh, Ms. Kelly personally uh, for chairing this session. Thank you very much. Okay, so th let's say thank you to Dr. Yavuz and Dr. Ismet because I could tell you guys are already very tired. <laughs> thank you so much for making time to join our webinar. And thank for audience, all the audience who stay with us tonight. So for more information about our company, because we will have regular re webinar every week. So please check on our Wysonic Facebook website, public account and LinkedIn. So thank you and see you next week. And goodbye Dr. Yavuz and Dr. Ismet. We can talk about thank the you. webinar later. And thank you so much. See you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.